All right, folks, welcome to today's webinar. This is brought to you by both the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center and the South Atlantic Blueprint team. So this is a special version of the September South Atlantic Third Thursday web forum that we're co-hosting with the Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, for those that you for those of you who are used to tuning into the third Thursday web forum every month that's doing double duty. So my name is Hillary Morris and I work on user support and communications for both the South Atlantic Blueprint and the Southeast Conservation Blueprint. So here's what to expect from today's webinar. We'll introduce today's speaker here, our presentation for about 40 minutes or so. We'll save time at the end for some Q&A and discussion. And then I'll wrap up by pre previewing next month's third Thursday web forum. So I'm going to hand it off to Carrie Furness with the Climate Adaptation Science Center to say a few additional words of welcome and talk a little bit about logistics. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so let me add my welcome uh, to this webinar on behalf of the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. We're really glad for this opportunity to partner with the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint team um, to host this presentation of science relevant to the Southeast CASC and this combined group of interested users. So I'm gonna quickly cover the, some of the features of the Zoom interface um, that we're using for the webinar, though I suspect that many of you are Zoom uh, aficionados now. Um, but as noted on the slide here, um, bottom left of your screen is where you um, can unmute and um, start, stop your video, ask that you please stay muted, except uh, if you're asking a question during the Q&A and keep your video off to, um, reduce um, distractions with our speaker. So um, I'm not certain that anyone is joining just by phone, but if so, star six is the way to mute unmute yourself in that case. Um, ask questions via the chat. And in that um, reactions bar, you can raise your hand during Q&A, which might help keep things orderly as we're taking questions for the presenter. So lastly, we are recording the presentation and you'll be able to access the recording afterwards in a couple of places, both Hillary will post it to the calendar event on the South Atlantic LCC website, and we'll post it on our science seminar web webpage and our YouTube channel at the Southeast CASC website. So um, for your review later. So now I'd like to launch just a short poll just to get a bit of information about who's with us today and also to sort of help us know how to continue to get information out about these seminars. So um, we'll give you just about a minute to um, fill this out, Just, uh, um, but it's helpful, I think, for our speaker to know maybe who's on the line with us today and um, what um, maybe points to, to emphasize or not and what questions to anticipate. So um, nice to see such a, a range of folks here and that you all read newsletters. So that's reassuring um, and that you pass the word. So very good. Um, yeah, I'll give you maybe just another few seconds to finish that up if you will and appreciate your um, providing us this information. So, okay, I'll go ahead and end that so we can move along. Thanks again for those and feel free if you didn't have a chance to um, fill that out to just um, chat me or um, in, in the um, during the webinar and let me know where you're from. So um, now I'd like to go ahead and move on to our presentation. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker um, today, who is Dr. Michelle Mormon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So Michelle works with uh, um, Fish and Wildlife Services Southeast Region Inventory and Monitoring Branch. Um, and she manages projects related to improving our understanding of water resources and coastal ecology on national wildlife refuges. So this includes overseeing the region's WRIAs, water resource inventories and assessments, which I think she'll get, uh, give us more information about during her presentation, and the Coastal Wetland Elevation Monitoring Network. So in addition, she provides science support to refuges in the region and helps individual refuges with their planning efforts. So I'll turn it over to you, Michelle, take it away. All right, great. Thanks, Carrie. And thanks everyone for joining today. I appreciate y'all taking time out of your busy day. So let me see, see if I can start sharing my screen. Can everybody see that? Carrie, give me a nod, great. All right, well, we'll get started. Um, 
So as Carrie just mentioned, I work for the US Fish and Wildlife Services um, National Wildlife Refuge System and their inventory and monitoring branch. Um, for most people here, I'm sure are familiar with the Fish and Wildlife Service, but just to revisit our mission, it's to work with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. And the National Wildlife Refuge System includes five, over 566 refuges nationwide, 100 million acres of land, and 750 million acres of oceans. There's 131 refuges here in the Southeast and 21 of those are coastal refuges in the South Atlantic geography. And so, let's see. All right, and specifically this study occurred on national wildlife refuges in the South Atlantic. So this map helps paint a picture of where just those coastal refuges occur. And I just wanna make an observation that when we take the view of the South Atlantic, these dots on the map make the refuges look so small. But when we zoom in and are actually on the ground, they seem so big. So it's kind of funny how mapping and data can change the scale of our reference. Um, and I also want to put out some acknowledgments before we start. I'm presenting today, but in order to navigate this geography at the refuge scale, uh, we have to acknowledge that it takes a village. So I just want to take a moment to note um, the multitude of people who have been so invaluable and pulling off this uh, long-term monitoring effort. Um, many of them are co-authors um, with me on various reports. Anyways, it's been no small feat and I can't thank them enough. In particular, I wanna acknowledge Zach Bladen who now works for the Fish and Wildlife Service and was the mastermind behind the R markdown code used to produce the trend analysis. Um, and previous CWIM coordinators, Nicole Rankin, who really got this project off the ground and running and Mike Chenard, who kept the reins going in between Nicole and I's tenure. And then I just, in addition, would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional and ancestral lands in the study area. So today I'm speaking from Raleigh, North Carolina, which is located on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Tuscarora and Lumbee people. And the study area occurs on coastal wetlands across the South Atlantic that are the traditional and ancestral lands of the Roanoke, Lumbee, Hatteras, Croatan, Madame Mesquite, Secretan, Wakama, Chakora, Winya, Siwi, Kuso, Yamasee, Muscogee, and Tamukwa people. All right, so let's dig in. As I previously mentioned, the US Fish and Wildlife Services mission is to protect plants, fish, and wildlife in their habitats. And so we took on this work because coastal wetlands provide important habitat for a variety of fish and wildlife species. And I'm pretty sure most people on the line, it, probably everybody, I believe that climate change is transforming our coastal wetlands. Um, sea level rise is causing shoreline and beach erosion, flooding and habitat loss. Saltwater intrusion is causing harbor dredging, habitat conversion, and affecting our impoundment management. And we've all seen the results of catastrophic fire and changes in water quality and quantity as a result of floods and droughts. And so at the beginning of the study, which was back in 2011 when they started to coordinate it, one of the major concerns of all the participating refuges was whether or not the natural processes that allow our coastal wetlands to naturally resist ecological transformation were enough. We wanted to know if coastal wetlands were gaining elevation at a rate that could pace with sea level rise. And then as a result, the Coastal Elevation Monitoring Network was designed with the following purpose in mind. So number one, we wanted to estimate rates of coastal wetland elevation change within a priority habitat on each refuge. And then we wanted to observe changes and forecast the longevity of these priority habitats. And finally, we wanted to provide management recommendations for wetland conservation. And so today I'm gonna to address four research questions. Um, the first is, what is the rate of elevation change measured within a priority habitat on each refuge within the Coastal Wetland Elevation Monitoring Network? The second is, are coastal wetlands vulnerable to the ecological transformation that are gonna occur as a result of sea level rise? The third is, are certain wetland types more vulnerable to ecological transformation? And the fourth is, how can we apply this information to inform management? 
And so beginning in 2012, this Coastal Wetland Elevation Monitoring Network was established and now includes 20 sites on 18 refuges throughout the South Atlantic. So this is a long-term data collection effort that focuses on four priority wetland habitats that include salt and freshwater oligohaline marshes, forested wetlands, and Pocosin wetlands. And so this study has truly been a regional monitoring effort that has depended on the support of the participating refuges to carry out the field methods, um, which include um, the annual elevation me measurements at the set stations and marker horizon plots and pore water salinity plots. Um, they've been collecting long-term data on the surface elevation, soil accretion, pore water salinity. Um, and in addition, we've gone out and we've surveyed in the benchmarks and measured vegetation composition and structure and soil chemistry. And we've followed documented methods that are based on the Lynch et al. protocol from 2015 and have developed a step down protocol um, in that we published in 2020 based on Lynch's and the National Park Service's protocol. And so in case you've never seen it, um, you're, here's some of the tools that we use. Um, so on the left, in the tools in the field, on the left is the RTK GPS unit that's used to survey in the benchmark. And then on the right is the set instrument and that's uh, Brian Van Druden at Alligator River Salt Marsh taking measurements with the set instrument. And so you can maybe tell from this photo that it's a very precise task that requires leveling the set, lowering pins to the marsh surface, and then measuring the height of the pins. There's nine pins and we read them in four cardinal directions. We also lay down feldspar plots, which is a little bit arduous carrying those 50 pound bags in the marsh. Um, but then once those feldspar plots are laid, we take cores at the plots each year. So three cores at a plot and three sites at a set plot. Um, and then in, again, we also take pore water salinity measurements. So if you really want the details on this, it's all explained in the protocol and you can even find our field sheets and site designs. And this is all found under the service catalog program. Um, service catalog is the Fish and Wildlife Services um, online digital library and Hillary can provide the link to that serve cat reference. And so um, I'm not gonna go into the details of how this all worked. There's really a lot of information that's been published out that there and we really follow the National Park Service protocol. Um, but this will give you a general idea of kind of how these measurements we take turn into the data and results that I'm about to present. So um, the set instrument measures wetland elevation change. So that's um, what you see B in the schematic and that's taking those pin heights through time. And then that benchmark elevation survey that we take with the RTK GPS allows us to then equate those pin height measurements into a wetland surface elevation um, reported in meters. The wetland elevation changes in millimeters per year. And then we can use this information to calculate a wetland elevation trend through time and relate it back to sea level and um, we don't actually measure sea level rise or uh, the tidal range datums ourselves. We rely on NOAA's data in order to get this information. So let's move on to our results. And the, uh, the first being, what is the rate of elevation change measured on each refuge within the Coastal Wetland Elevation Monitoring Network? And so I'm gonna start with our lowest common denominator, the set station and site. So up on the left-hand corner, you see a map. I believe this is at the Alligator River Salt Marsh site. And you can see that at a site, we actually have three stations. And these stations represent the set plot where all these measurements on um, surface elevation, poor water salinity, and accretion are made. And so um, if you read the paper, um, the white paper by Layden and myself in 2021, you'll see that there's a similar schematic for this, like this, for each one of our sites. And so in figure B, which is the upper right hand corner, you see the station level trends. So that is the trend at each set station. 
Um, and, and so that is the trend over time. And then we average them and we get a trend for the site. So that trend for the site is actually replicated three times. Um, and so in addition to this graph, um, the R markdown paper also provides a nice summary that includes the date of collection, the location of the set stations, and the estimated trend and surface elevation at both the station and site level. Um, and it includes an estimate of mean and standard error. So um, if you're interested in any site level trends, um, you can go to that report and pull that information out. So moving on, um, we can then show the site level trend. So here we are looking at all the sites in the network that have at least five years of data on the X axis. And then on the Y axis, we can see the set trend, that's the surface elevation trend in millimeters per a year. Um, and if you dig into the report, you actually see we present this a couple different ways. But let's take a minute to kind of break down this plot. Um, so there's a couple things that stand out to me, but might not jump out to you if you don't know the sites. So um, over on the far right are the two sites within the Pocosin habitat. And you can see from this graph that they're subsiding, which probably shouldn't be a surprise to those of you who are familiar with peatland Pocosins. Um, and then next to the two of them is the Roanoke River site, which is our forested wetland site. And it is also losing elevation through time, um, but we'll get to that story in another minute. And then the other thing that jumped out is that our freshwater um, wetlands had the greatest set greater set trends than the salt marsh sites, except at the salt marsh sites within the Albemarle Sound at Alligator River, Swan Quarter, and Pea Island National Wildlife Refuges. And for those of you out there that work in the Albemarle Sound, you know the hydrology is just different. It's an embayed estuary with little to no tidal flow, which may be um, part of the reason that we see that trend. So let's move on to the next question. Are coastal wetlands vulnerable to ecological transformation as a result of sea level rise? And so we'll start by looking at the mean sea level rise trend for each site. And as you can see in this bar chart, it pretty much follows what is known and published. The northern part of North, the northeast part of North Carolina has the highest rates of sea level rise. And then as we go south, in North Carolina and south along the South Atlantic, the sea level rise rate diminishes to a, due to a variety of factors. And so what we're looking at next is the mean set elevation in yellow against the mean sea level red rise trend in blue in meters per meters over time. And so I'll walk you through this graph so you can process it a little better. Uh, each facet plot is the individual site being monitored, and the x-axis is the date, On the y-axis is the mean elevation in meters. So there's some magic that happened in the background to help us get here. We had to go out and get an elevation of the benchmark and then compute a vertical offset. And then we could relate the set trend to get a true surface elevation through time, which could then be compared to the NOAA sea level rise trend through time. So a couple things to point out here. There are three sites that occur in non-marsh habitats. Two of those sites are Alligator River and Pocosin Lakes. And what we can see is that both of those sites are subsiding. They're losing elevation. But the Alligator River site is much closer to sea level. In fact, over the past 10 years, between the gains of sea level rise and the subsidence we've measured, it's essentially at sea level now. Whereas in contrast, the Coast and Lake site, although also subsiding at a similar rate, um, it's three meters above sea level. So it has more elevation capital than the site at Alligator River. Now let's look at the Roanoke River site, our forested wetland, which has been losing elevation while sea level is rising. And we see that this wetland is at the mouth of the Roanoke River and it's slowly being submerged. And then if you look closely at the trend, you'll see that there's some variation that could be related to variation in the discharges in the Roanoke River as a result of dam releases. And then finally, the rest of the sites are located in either those low salinity or high salinity marshes. And we'll get to that story in a minute. But the thing to take home is that a site 
its risk of submergence depends on its starting elevation. So the next step is to map the location of these sites relative to the elevation profile of the habitat on the refuge to determine how representative it is of the entire marsh. But we're not gonna get there today because I haven't gotten there yet. All right, so moving on um, and looking at accretion data within the set world, it's important to measure accretion and conduction to surface elevation to better help us better understand the subsurface processes that are driving the trend. So measuring accretion is its own beast, but we don't need to get into that today. But then interpreting, interpreting the data also takes a minute to wrap your brain around, or so it did for me and my co-author, Zach. Um, and so Zach made this schematic to help us kind of better understand how this works. So we have our accretion trend, which is our marker horizon data. And then we have our set uh, elevation trend, which is our set data. And so according to uh, the Lynch et al, there's kind of three scenarios that can be going on with subsurface processes. Um, so if the marker horizon data is greater than the set data, then that indicates that subsidence is occurring. And if the set trend is positive, it also indicates that accretion is driving any surface elevation gains that we're seeing. Now, in cases where the marker horizon data and the set data are relatively equal, that is an indication that maybe there's no subsurface processes going on, or I've started to actually think that it could also be an indication that there is subsurface expansion going on that's countering the subsidence that might happen otherwise. And then finally, if marker horizon or the accretion trend is less than the set trend, it's an indication that we have shallow, shallow expansion in the subsurface, potentially due to increased biomass. And so, Let's dig into the data from the network. So this graph is showing us the difference between um, at each site and on the y-axis, the difference between the accretion rates and the surface elevation trends. So that's um, in the three facets. And then uh, we have the set trend and the marker horizon trend plotted. So anyways, um, as we see, shallow subsidence is occurring at the majority of our sites. Um, there are two sites where there appear to be no subsurface processes, according to Jim Lynch. Um, and this helps provide, uh, one of those is Roanoke River Forested Wetland. And this helps provide some evidence at Roanoke River that erosion or a lack of accretion might be driving the loss of elevation at this site or driving the fact that there's uh, no elevation gain and they are losing elevation. And then we also see this Alligator River, there's no subsurface processes, according to Lynch's model. Um, but we see at Cedar Island and Mackey Island that there is subsurface expansion. And so I was thinking about this this morning, and I remembered that at Mackey Island, Roanoke River, and Cedar Island, all three of those sites have been burned at least once, if not twice, since this study began. And so I'm actually wondering if what we're seeing, sorry, at the Alligator River salt marsh where the model says no subsurface and actual um, ac accumulation of biomass due to the burning that's countering the subsidence happening. And then those prescribed burns at Cedar Island and Mackey Island um, also are showing increased biomass due to the prescribed burns happening on those um, refuges. But that's just a plausible working hypothesis for us to consider. Um, we can test it later. I haven't tested it yet, but if it proves out true, that would be um, you know, great evidence to support um, that management technique on our refuges. All right, so moving on to the next question. Are certain wetland types more vulnerable to ecological transformation? And so just as a reminder, the inference of the study was for the priority habitat on the refuge where the, um, the sets were being sampled. And those habitats included salt and oligohaline freshwater marshes, forested wetlands, and Pocosin wetlands. And so I mentioned we collect poor water salinity uh, data at the sites. 
And so those poor water salinity measurements provide a snapshot of salinity regimes at the site. Um, and that data really um, corresponds with our classification of those wetlands on the previous slide, um, that all the oligohaline and freshwater sites fall to the left of that five part per thousand salinity line and all the other sites fall to the right. All right, so although the refuge was at, the inference was at the refuge level, um, we started to see some trends by habitat pop out at us as we began to analyze and explore the data. And so we decided to investigate whether coastal wetland types are keeping pace with sea level rise uh, um, across these different priority habitat types in the South Atlantic. So in this graph, we're looking at the difference between set and sea level rise trends in millimeters per year, and they're grouped by habitat types. So positive values, the i.e. the values above that um, dashed line at zero indicate that the sets are increasing relative to sea level rise. And in those cases, coastal wetlands may be able to increase at a rate sufficient to overcome inundation due to sea level rise. So to test for the differences in the relationship between sets and sea level rise elevation change among these coastal wetland types, we fit a generalized linear model with the difference in trends as a response variable and coastal wetland types as a single predictor variable. We found that there were differences among coastal wetland types tested for pairwise, because we tested for pairwise differences in trends of using two keys post hoc text. We found that all four coastal wetland types significantly differed. And of the four coastal wetland types, only oligohaline wetlands within our study area have a surface elevation trend greater than the corresponding sea level rise. And so um, kind of the conclusion of this result is that the oligohaline marshes were really the most robust habitat type and they're keeping pace with sea level rise often due to accretion. And then the salt marshes are not quite keeping up with sea level rise that our forested wetlands at Roanoke River are drowning because they aren't accreting and potentially are eroding, and that our peatland pocosins are subsiding and vulnerable to sea level rise at lower elevations. All right, so on to our last question, and probably the one of most interesting, at least to me, how can we apply this information to inform our management? Well, let's be rad. And what's being rad, it's a new acronym that thanks to Scott Covington, I've learned a lot about, but rad stands for resist, accept, and direct. There's a lot of great information coming out about this framework. And if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to check out the US Fish and Wildlife Services climate page. Um, they have some great links on there, but I'll try to present the nuts and bolts. Essentially, this is a conservation framework to help managers weigh out the costs and benefits of management options when ecological transformations are occurring. They can decide to resist, which in some cases is needed, and this action indicates that interventions are being taken to restore the habitat to historic conditions. They can decide to accept, which suggests that they will allow the ecological transformation to occur with little or no intervention, and then find a uh, they can decide to direct the change and promote the ecological transformation to a new condition through directed management actions. And it should also be mentioned that you can use a combined approach, which in most cases probably will be the approach. And uh, just a quick note that um, for those of you that are familiar with strategic habitat conservation, the RAD framework, the Resist, Accept, Direct framework, has been incorporated into this in what's called the Climate Smart Cycle. This has all been done by the FedNet Climate Change Interagency Group, and I would go to there for more information. So let's just talk quickly about some RAD ideas that have emerged with discussions with managers as we've presented this result. So RAD idea number one, resist change in Pocosins. So 70%, there's been a 70% loss of Pocosins in North Carolina since 1962 due to drainage and ditching. Um, here's a map showing the drainage system on the Albemarle Peninsula. And it's this drainage and ditching that's changed the hydrology um, and oxidizing the soils and causing that subsidence that we see being measured by the set. 
And so our rad example of resisting is hydrologic restoration in the Pocosins. And here's an example from Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. They've undertaken a tremendous amount of work to rewet the peat with the thought that they, if they restore the natural water patterns, they're rewetting the peat, reducing oxidation, and uh, ultimately might reduce subsidence. In addition, when, why this is so important is that this peatland restoration reduces the risk of catastrophic fires, it increases carbon storage, and it improves important habitat for our trust species. Now the Rex, I, next rad idea is directing marsh resilience, and I'm gonna provide an example from Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge. As the set data show, tidal marshes are keeping up with sea level rise due to accretion, freshwater tidal marshes. Um, but as Craig and I guess some of the colleagues from the USGS Wetland Center have shown, the managed marshes are not keeping up with sea level rise. And that working hypothesis is that they are sediment starved because they're cut off from the river. So the idea is the refuge would like to build elevation within the managed marshes by increasing tidal change. And these tidal marshes are critically important for pollinators, secretive marsh birds, waterfowl, swallowtail kites, and our fisheries. So the next rad idea is acquiring higher elevation forested wetlands. And this is an example of accepting. The idea being that if we can expand and modify refuge boundaries to purchase higher elevation forests, uh, forested wetlands upstream, then we can protect habitat for such important species such as swallowtail kites, neotropical migrants, pollinators, bats, butterflies, wood ducks. And in addition, these uh, forested wetlands are great sinks for carbon. Um, and in some cases, such as Waccamaw, the acquisition of these forested wetlands would also include the acquisition of these freshwater ligahaline marshes um, that are robust to sea level rise. And then finally, the last rad idea I wanna present is a combined rad idea that emerged from a recent Black Rail workshop that I was um, privileged to attend. Um, but those people who work on Black Rails know that uh, the Black Rails are become a threatened and endangered species. And we're really concerned about what is going on with Black Rails along the East Coast. And so this rad idea has been proposed um, because uh, to accept the change, accept or maybe direct the change, but accept the fact that we're losing salt marsh habitat, particularly that high marsh habitat for black rail, and that might be part of their decline. Um, and so the idea is to direct the change and manage freshwater marshes inland for black rail. And so black rail, I, I learned at this workshop, have very specific needs related to hydrology and vegetation. So that the idea is that this could be accomplished within uh, freshwater inland managed impoundments. And so um, the monitoring, what next? The monitoring continues while we work on publishing these results. Um, uh, and then we continue conversations with the refuges to improve their understanding of this data and help them identify RAD management decisions. Uh, we also continue working to collaborate with other regions on database development, analysis, and national assessments, continue collaborating with partners on integrated set analysis. And then we have a pretty exciting project that um, we're developing with Neil Ganju's shop at USGS. He recently published this unvegetative vegetated um, ratio data set. And so we're working with him and others to determine, to compare how um, lateral accretion measured by the UVBR compares to the vertical accretion measured by our sets. And so going back to the initial question, will the coastal wetlands stay or will they go? Well, I guess it might just depend on how rad we are. So thank y'all for attending today. I appreciate your time. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Awesome presentation. Um, the chat box has been happening, absolutely. Uh, lots of questions and great discussion among some of the folks on the line actually answering each other's questions, which is fabulous. So I'm gonna kind of scroll up to the beginning and I'll just read the questions aloud for the benefit of the recording. 
Uh, first question was from Barbara, uh, who said, such great research. Is there research of this type going on in South Florida, a website available for the Florida area, also in the Great Lakes? And I will say that Sarah shared links to a Gulf of Mexico set inventory, a North Carolina set map, and sets for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but if, if you were able to comment on the availability of this data in South Florida or the Great Lakes, that would be awesome. Great, great. Uh, so I would actually direct her, there was, well, there's been a couple studies. So there's a study by um, Osland et al. that, um, and I, I don't know the link off my top of my head, but that's like a metadata analysis of all the set stations in the Gulf, and it includes South Florida. In addition, Scott Covington pulled together a white paper um, that identifies all the sets located on refuge lands across the United States. And then a colleague of mine, Jeremy Conrad, manages a set network, but they're a couple of years behind us in their data collection. And, and um, so they're not, they don't quite have enough data yet to analyze the data for a trend. You really need a minimum of five years of data to do the trend analysis. Um, but the goal is it will also go in the set database and potentially can use the same code to streamline the analysis. Thank you. There was another question about how doing prescribed burns, given that they consume fuels, would contribute biomass material for accretion. I think this might be a case where some folks in the chat have actually answered that. Um, some people suggested that be, that might happen because burning would stimulate regrowth and an overall increase in biomass since the marshes tend to regrow quickly with the herbaceous species that they're comprised of. Also, it was suggested in the chat that burning could stimulate below ground productivity, which might contribute to root volume expansion as a result of the additional growth. But I just wanted to give you a chance to respond to that. Could you talk a little bit about maybe the mechanism that you might see for prescribed burning actually increasing um, accretion and biomass, even though it's consuming fuels? Well, thank you those of you in the <laughs> chat who answered that question for me. It's just a working hypothesis, and it kind of came to me this morning looking at the data. So I haven't looked at, the, anyways, you know how that sometimes goes when you haven't looked at something for a while and then you do. Um, so, but yes, I agree with both of those um, responses. Cool. Let's see, next up, um, when you were talking about the data comparing different types of coastal wetlands and the trends across those, I don't know if you might wanna navigate back to that slide. There was a question from uh, someone about the time periods do the time periods differ across those different types of coastal wetlands or is it the same? Yeah, great question. So this is a coordinated network. Um, and so one of my roles is to coordinate um, with all the folks on the refuges who are carrying um, out the brunt of the monitoring each year. And um, so although there are years that have been missed, all of the, well, first of all, if you really wanna dig into it, I suggest looking into the details in the white paper, but it, this was all established in 2012 and um, been sampled. Um, all the refuges that were included in the analysis continue their sampling up to this day. They might have missed a year here or there due to all kinds of reasons, but um, so the data spans from 2012 to 2020 and uh, the plan is to go out again this year. So it, it's the same time span. I might pause here um, from the questions in the chat and just see if anybody wanted to unmute themselves and speak up verbally. Um, and if not, I'll go back to the chat because we've got plenty to talk about there, but I'll just pause. And if you wanna unmute yourself um, and just speak up with a question directly, go ahead. So Billy Brooks down in Jacksonville uh, suggested that hurricanes can be significant accretion events for coastal marshes. And I was wondering if this uh, ongoing study, have you guys uh, documented such? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something we want to look into. Um, so we have a list of kind of all the significant hurricanes that have happened. That, that really, I think, first of all, the inference for this study was at the um, priority habitat refuge level. And so um, 
we actually compiled a list of all the major hurricanes that would have affected all the refuges included in this, but uh, we'd have to go through and do that analysis um, site by site, and we just haven't had the time to get there yet. But that's a great question and definitely something that could be investigated, but I don't, I don't think it would be done at the network scale. Yeah. Let me turn back to the chat for a minute. A question from Steve about whether you have any information about potential biological factors that would influence marsh stability. For example, nutria herbivory in the Chesapeake Bay marshes was a significant contributor to their marsh loss. That's a great question. I, I know there's pesky nutria <laughs> out there. Um, having worked before on some of these refuges, um, but no, we haven't incorporated that into our analysis. But that's a great question, Steve. Thanks for bringing that up. Maybe. <laughs> and, and what would we do about the nutria? <laughs> that's that's also a question. Right. Mm -hmm. This isn't so much a question, but it's an offer of collaboration from Rob, who says that the NRCS currently has a coastal zone soil survey program where they could add soils information for every one of your set sites. And he says that they'd love to sample the soils for you and maybe get you some additional information on the site to inform your science. So he had to leave the meeting early, but he did include the uh, coastal zone soil survey program link. And um, I'm sure using registration information for the webinar that we could put you in touch with Rob if that's something that you're interested in pursuing. That'd be great. Thank you. Awesome. So yeah, we've had some great um, links shared in the chat of additional resources. A question from Jennifer, have you parsed out high marsh versus low marsh for the salt marshes? Or do you have any information about mangroves potentially moving in? Well, well that's a two-pronged question and that's a great yeah. question. Um, so I will go back Jennifer to this side um, with the caveat. So within our salt marshes, the idea was actually to sample the high marsh. So that, that was the initial design um, because of our concerns for um, species such as the black rail that really depend on that high marsh habitat. But as you can see from some of our benchmark elevation surveys, so we chose um, high marshes, but you know the elevation of those marshes maybe aren't as high as we'd like them to be. Um, but theoretically, all of our salt marsh sites were in the high marsh because there was such a lack of information about high marsh sites, and that really is one of the critical habitats we're concerned with. Now, as far as the mangroves go, uh, again, um, my colleague Jeremy Conrad down in South Florida has been um, working on a network on refuges down there, um, but that's, uh, mangroves aren't in this study area. Great. Let's see, um, I've shared the link to the SERP. People have been asked about links to the report. Um, that's main SERP cat page has links to lots of different publications about this work, including the most recent one from 2021 that Michelle referenced. Um, question, does the subsurface expansion have a long-term trend or a short-term trend? For example, is it seasonal? Uh, that's a great question. So I, I mentioned, and if you dig into the Leyden report, you'll see marker horizon data is tricky. It, it disappears. That's why we actually don't have marker horizon data for all of our sites. Anybody who works with it will, will know the headaches of it. Um, but you know, sometimes you can never recover it at all. Um, but yeah, it usually doesn't stay out there for much more than two or three years. And so I forget his name, but Wendy Stanham put me in touch with him. There's a researcher at NC State, I think, who's looking at doing some isotope sampling at these sites. And so um, it would be really great if he could get accretion rates, because I think the isotope sampling actually allows for like a 10 year accretion rate which would be more comparable with this data. So yes, there are um, issues with marker horizon data, but it's the best we got. Okay. And here's an interesting question from Jessica, as someone whose family recently bought a house outside of Holden Beach across from the interco intercoastal waterway. Um, she was doing some research on GIS map 
found her property and discovered that the lot next to them is a wetland um, by the National Wetland Inventory. And so she was wondering that as, as homeowners, you know, that lot's only seven tenths of an acre, but is there anything homeowners could be doing to do their part to protect these wetlands, these coastal wetlands? I, I mean, I, question. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, this is, uh, this is, okay, this is a little bit out of, um, you know, my capacity, but uh, so this is maybe a, a something that I've observed. What I would say is that the reason that these coastal wetlands are able to keep pace with sea level rise is the accretion um, that's occurring. And so this is really a good reason why living shorelines are, if they can happen, are a great idea because when you um, put up that bulkhead, what happens is you lose your ability to accrete on the wetland. It kind of creates a barrier. Um, but this is really outside of my expertise. Um, but I know there's got to be resources out there that mm -hmm. um, for homeowners and such um, on this topic. Yeah, thanks for taking a stab at it. Um, we have a couple more still coming in in the chat. This is a really active group. Love to see the interest and the engagement. Thank you guys so much. I am going to pause one more time just to see if anybody wanted to speak up. Um, and then I'll go back to the chat again because we do still have some time to, to keep chatting. So um, I'll pause and see if anybody wants to unmute and speak up with a question verbally. I have a question, but this is Carrie, but I can um, I can hold it to the end and see if we get to it. But my question is around this RAD framework. And Michelle, are there designated individuals at Fish and Wildlife who are responsible for connecting with the refuges to sort of walk through these scenarios and frameworks? Or is that does that happen on an individual refuge basis? Um, anyway, I just I didn't know how um, how that's being coordinated at the at the um, Fish and Wildlife Service level. Um, I will. I I think maybe Scott Covington is the one kind of um, that participates participates in the FedNet. Um, you know, I don't know if there's like a how it's being filtered down to the field. It's still you know kind of a new idea. Um, to well, it's probably it's been around for a while, but it's really maybe getting out in the vernacular now you know at the field level um so now if you have any suggestions on on that then um feel free to share but and we don't have a coordinated like effort to like work with every field station to you know work through this framework that i know of we might actually so <laughs> don't quote me on that <laughs> scrub from the record all right thanks yeah <laughs> delete <laughs> I'm also including a link in the chat. Um, we posted a blog on, in the South Atlantic newsletter back in March. This doesn't really address your direct question, Carrie, but it was a report um, on this resist, accept, direct framework by the Park Service that if um, you're interested in learning more about RAD, um, that could be a good place to start. And Sarah included a link in the chat as well to a new training in the Gulf about RAD. So it definitely seems like, like this is a new, a new wave of a framework for thinking about these sorts of issues. Uh, I'll go back to the chat. Question from Tom. The Piedmont ecoregion has seen stream degradation due to downcutting and transporting these sediments. Where did those sediments go? I would expect eventually those sediments would move downstream and deposit into the coastal waters to accrete. Philosophically, do we need to encourage more sedimentation into certain waterways to replenish coastal marsh elevations and submerged aquatic vegetation beds? That's, um, yeah, so there is uh, some information out there. Again, this is getting a little bit out of my area of expertise, but what I've read from the literature, sediment starvation, you know, can decrease accretion and be a reason that our marshes aren't keeping pace quite as well. Um, part of that is due to dams. So, um, you know, one strategy that's been identified is dam removal. Um, but, you know, of course there are, there's always costs and benefits to everything, you know, mm -hmm. have too much sediment can be a bad thing for, uh, you know, the fish living in with the streams. Right. But, 
but yeah, so probably, uh, you know, what makes it downstream is, um, you know, major dams that are like within the like, you know, physiographic kind of divide between the Piedmont and the, uh, I mean, I don't know, you know, we need a coastal geomorphologist to help us out <laughs> with that land. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, a point from Brian Hummel in the chat, as well as the soil surveys, which can accord so record soil organic matter. There are examples around the country where private sector funds are being used to conserve coastal wetlands and mangroves through carbon sequestration markets, carbon plus. These investments help preserve these nature-based solutions and mitigate natural hazards like flooding hurricanes and storm surge. Um, great point, Brian. And Whitney does suggest um, for Jessica, who asked about what homeowners can do, that Sea Grant is a, often a great resource for homeowners who want to see what they can do to conserve their coastal properties. That's a great suggestion. I am out of questions in the chat, so um, I'm going to stop again to see if anybody else wants to speak up. Uh, or put any more questions in the chat before we move on. I'm just going to preview next month's web forum. Um, all these coastal folks who might be interested in looking a little bit further offshore to the open ocean and what we have planned for October. Um, and then we can pause again for questions at the end. So I'll just stop here and see if anybody else has a question before we move on. Hillary, not a question, but um, to the question about um, adding sediments from upstream to downstream. I feel like the NOAA and their work on the Sentinel sites and especially Karen Curran has addressed some of those topics. I don't know if they have exact data or not, but um, I know they were considering that when they were studying um, the marsh's ability to work, uh, you know, to keep up with sea level rise as well. So that might be a source. Gotcha. Thank you for that. One more question coming in. Did you investigate lateral movement of vegetation at all? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and, and so that references back to our collaboration with Neil, um, with Neil Ganju and his work with this unvegetated vegetated ratio. So I wasn't gonna bring this um, in, into the presentation today, but uh, this is an example from Bayou Sauvage National Wildlife Refuge. So they started restoration, actually doing something similar to what Waccamaw is proposing, flooding these kind of um, inland waters that have been cut off from tidal flows and thus we're getting sediment starved. But so his work can actually look at the lateral change in vegetation of coastal wetlands. And so what we see in this like preliminary data is that in 2016, um, increased vegetation in this restoration area. And then in 2018, it's even more um, vegetated. And we can actually then use this information to calculate an increase of 50% at Turtle Bayou and a 36% increase in vegetation at Bayou Cheve and kind of quantify our restoration success, which is pretty exciting. Awesome. Yeah, really exciting. Um, and so the next step, there's actually a student, Car Caroline Strom, I'm probably mispronounced her last name, but she's been taking this unvegetated vegetated ratio um, that's in this next slide um, that we can use to assess vulnerability. Um, here's an example from Mackey Island and comparing that to our set data to give us a better understanding of how the lateral movement corresponds with the vertical movement. Um, and so what's really cool about that, I'm a big fan of like a multi-pronged approach, right? Like these long-term monitoring sites are important, but they're measuring one site in one place over time. And so if we compare that up with some remote sensing data, we can get a better picture of the entire system. Great, thank you. That's the last question I see in the chat. Um, we're having a vigorous discussion about the pros and cons of beaver, which I love. I will leave, leave you guys to that for now. Um, let me go ahead and preview next month's webinar. So I'm going to take uh, look over sharing here just for a quick second, and then we can pause again for questions at the end if anything else occurs to you all in the meantime. 
So this is what we have on deck for the October 3rd Thursday Web Forum. I'm really excited about this talk. Um, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Matt Pody and Dr. Arliss Winship with NOAA, who are both with the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. And they're going to be talking about a study um, to develop maps of predicted spatial distributions of deep sea corals and hard bottom habitats in the Southeast Atlantic. Um, they're doing this to inform and support environmental risk assessments, environmental impact statements, and other decisions related to the review of proposed offshore energy development in this region. So they've compiled a database of presence absence observations of deep sea corals and hard bottom habitats um, containing data from field surveys uh, using underwater vehicles. And they've integrated those observations with various environmental predictors to predict and map where they estimate 24 different deep sea coral taxa and hard bottom habitats throughout the study area are likely to be. So I think this is going to be a really neat data set. We're using kind of the, the existing version of this in the South Atlantic Blueprint in an improvement to our hard bottom and deep sea coral indicator. And we hope to be able to incorporate this new data into the future. So we're really excited to learn more about this and, and talk to Matt and Arliss about this work. So if you're interested, I definitely encourage you to tune in next month. It'll be the third Thursday at 10 a.m. as always, October 21st, and the usual Teams connection information that we typically use for this web forum. So if you go to southatlanticlcc.org, um, you can get to the calendar event for this web forum, and I can put the link in the chat as well. So that's what's on deck for next month. With that, I'm going to go ahead and pause again for questions, and um, I'll put a link to the South Atlantic LCC website in the chat, as well as the CCAS website, where you can sign up for the CCAS newsletter and the South Atlantic Blueprint newsletter if you're interested, and I encourage um, my co-hosts at the Climate Adaptation Science Center to do the same. But before we close things out, we do have two more minutes, so if anyone else has a question for Michelle um, or for any of us, please feel free to jump in. Hillary, if I may tag on to your yeah. um, announcement of the, um, this th Thursday web forum, and <clears throat> this looks like a great presentation coming up, so excited to join that. Um, we are likely to be announcing um, our fall winter um, series. Um, we're still nailing down all of our presentations, but um, check back um, the CCAS website or sign up for the newsletter, and um, so you can learn more about that as, as those announcements come out. In addition, we have some global um, change seminars that are going to be organized by our um, student, our graduate student um, global change fellows. So um, stay tuned for those uh, for those announcements as well. Thanks. Great. Any other questions while I drop some links in the chat here? All right, hearing none, um, thank you so much, Michelle, for this wonderful presentation and for all of you for tuning in and contributing to this great discussion today. Uh, it was great to see you all. And um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and close out for today. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Bye, everybody. Awesome.